Your church hasn't got a clock at the back. You won't keep an eye on me. Well, look, we live in a pretty technical, a pretty sophisticated world. And we're coming here tonight and it's all rigged up and it's, it's, it's great. We live in that sort of world. We live in a world where there's um, a great deal of uh, medical help to fall back on when we're not well. We grumble about the NHS, but honestly, you know, seeing situations around the world and looking at what we've got, uh, we just give thanks to God, really, don't we? Our high-powered scientific academic capabilities can't be doubted. So why do we live in an age that's so, so characterized? As if it was an era of anxiety. Where's that coming from? Have you noticed how much anxiety is about? Now, I, I've been sharing with you a little bit about what I do in the course of my working week, and I, I get amongst farming people a lot. Big hard guys. Anxious. Where's that coming from? It's not coming from their laptop, let me tell you that, because laptop, they may not be able to spell it. Okay? Where's that coming from? That anxiety. Now, let's be clear at the very outset, and please hear what I'm saying to you. There is such a thing as a medical anxiety, okay? There is. It's sort of the close cousin of depression. And, and these things can be a medical ailment, they can afflict us. It can be clinical. And we have a lot to do with folks, and perhaps we are folks, who are in that position in life. And, and that's one of the reasons we need to go around living gently with people. I'm talking about the other thing. I'm talking about common or garden anxiety, if you like. Why is there so much of it out there? Why are we dealing with so much? I suspect it's been taking root from uncomfortable uncertainty. Uncomfortable uncertainty. A life without God is an uncertain life, you know. Very uncertain. People say to me, it's all a bit random. Hang on a minute. <laughs> not in my way of thinking, it's not. But it's the uncertainty that's breeding the anxiety in so many people's cases. And look, if the Christian is anything, the Christian is certain. We've read the end of the book and the Lamb wins. We've looked at the life of the Lord Jesus and we know that he is the conqueror of sin and death and hell. There are certainties to embrace. There is hope in this gospel. And it strikes me that as evangelicals, and I think we all are probably in the room anyway, nobody's left yet. We're not very good at this. We're not very good at hope and communicating the hope that we have in the gospel. It, it doesn't matter. I'm going to live forever and life can be hard. But I know where I'm going. There is hope in Christ. He is the one who conquered death. He is risen from the grave and our world is full of people you'd think were called Thomas. Thomas. Not Mr. Thomas, you know what I mean? Thomas the twin. And they need that experience of God that Thomas had. To plant and to nourish and to nurture the hope that's held out in the gospel. Today we're going to do a quick case study of Thomas the twin and we're going to ask how hope can dawn for a person crippled by the loss of hope and the anxiety that comes from it. And in doing that, we'll be asking the question, what is it that moves a person from disappointment and disillusionment and anxiety, which is where Thomas was, otherwise, why did he run away and wasn't with the disciples anymore when Jesus first came? Bringing his pessimism back when he did come back. His loss of hope. How does a person who is short on positive thoughts come to a position of hope by becoming a Christian? How does that work? How does a person come to make that change? Listen. The Spirit of God is at work, right? We know that, we believe that. But how does it work at the individual level? Cognitively for that person. Firstly, the psychology of a doubter. I 
I thought he'd lost his finger for a minute. There we are. The anatomy of Thomas' unbelief. We're looking at John 20, 24 to 29. Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. There's a clue. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, but he wasn't encouraged. He didn't join in their little dance. He said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails are, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. He's grumpy, isn't he? He's in the dumps. He can't dare believe it. So a week later, the disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Something's changed. Something's changed. He's in the house. Hmm. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came, stood among them and said, okay, you want your evidence? Here it is. You see, he's letting Thomas know that he knows. And Thomas, there's no hint in the scripture, there's no hint in that text that Thomas put his hand anywhere. Why is that? Hmm. My Lord and my God. That is a really rapid shift of position, isn't it? Do you find people falling down in the streets of Bridge End and crying out, what must I do to be saved? No, no, no. Don't go out on, we may, you may happen, but don't go out this weekend with Roger and expect things like that to happen in a rush. This man has moved a huge distance in a short space of time. What's brought it about? What's going on in that man's head? Well, to be perfectly honest, the Gospels haven't really got a lot to tell us about Thomas. In John 11:16, the disciples are a bit wary of following Jesus in the direction of Jerusalem, where they feared for Jesus' safety and no doubt their own. And it was Thomas who loyally, if rather negatively, persuaded them. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let's also go that we may die with him. I think I'm clocking a bit of a pessimist. What do you think? He's not a bundle of laughs, old Thomas, is he? Thomas, the Aramaic, Didymus, the Greek, both mean twin. I don't know any more about his family relationships than that. But it seems safe to say that Thomas might have been a twin. And how he got on with his siblings, we just don't know, but he certainly had a fairly grim, but nonetheless, definite loyalty to Jesus. He was just a bit grim about it. And a bit pessimistic. And then we read in John 14, 15, that after Jesus had been trying to prepare his disciples for his departure, talking about his father having a house that Jesus was going to go to in order to prepare a place there for his disciples, Thomas simply didn't, didn't get it. We can reckon Thomas was not expecting to be an eyewitness to the resurrection. And he's headed for a shock. Which makes sense of the first thing we need to really take note of about the incident we're looking at in John 20 today. He was absent when Jesus turned up. It says a lot. He wasn't there to see this momentous event that the Lord had spent a lot of effort trying to prepare them for. And I find that surprising, but the books tend to suggest I shouldn't be surprised by that. Mill, in his message John, he says the death of Jesus was such an overwhelming reality that he must get alone to try to come to terms with it. Thomas had just gone away to be alone with his sorrow. Dig himself a little hole for himself to be in. He's lost, his, he's lost his Jesus. He's died on the cross. Thomas saw it happen. It was awful. He's gone away with his pain. He turns in on himself. That's his, that's his natural reaction. He's one of those. You know the ones? When Jesus comes to the disciples that Easter evening, Thomas is not there. Now, okay, you can understand. The fact is, the same Thomas who'd shown, shown such great loyalty when he wanted to stick with Jesus on the journey up to Jerusalem, let's go with him, that we might die with him, he's far from wanting to stick with the disciples after the traumatic events of the crucifixion. The powers in the land had crucified the Lord, he thought the game was up, but no doubt he expected that together in a huddle, if once caught, that was going to be a risky place to be. He wasn't there. We're starting to see little windows into Thomas's psychology, okay? But then another window opens. He is reluctant to believe the other disciples' testimony. Why? Why, why? why would that be? These are guys, he's, you know, they're his buddies. They're his close, 
it looks like a, a really good male fellowship, actually, if you read through, you know, what's happening with the disciples as they wander around Galilee. It's a fellowship of guys. Why? Why is he saying, I'm not going to believe it? Fancy, fancy turning to somebody you've been close to, mates with, you know, work or whatever you're involved in, for three years or so, and you turn and say, I don't believe you. That's weird, isn't it? They're your mates. Now, what happens here is the other disciples tell him, we've seen the Lord, and I suppose they meant that to be an encouragement for their possibly slightly pessimistic and now, no doubt, rather downcast companion. The other disciples, they're blown away by seeing the risen Jesus, and they take no pains at all to meet Thomas where he is down in the dumps, but they trumpet this cheerful truth on his downcast ear. And if he's of a pessimistic disposition, and we're saying it looks like he is, and if he is in a downcast frame of mind as well after the crucifixion, then that blurted message, we've seen the Lord, might be almost guaranteed to be heard taken the wrong way and heard of something else. Something more like, Jesus came but you missed the party, loser. Yeah. He's that pessimistic, he's going to take it the wrong way. Do you see what I mean? Thomas's anxiety at the situation, discouragement with events. It isn't going to be helped at all by this. We've seen the Lord, yay! Oh. So he immediately starts laying down conditions for faith. Rather than accepting his friend's testimony to their joyful experience, Thomas lays down conditions for coming to believe. And it's typically blunt and it's typically straightforward, given what we've already heard from Thomas. He said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now you can tell pretty much Thomas was pretty much up to speed with the crucifixion and the events of the crucifixion. He knows what went on and he knows it was lethal. No one could have received the wounds Thomas is describing and lived. It wasn't happening as far as Thomas was concerned. So if Thomas could see and actually touch a living body that had received wounds like those, that would show he was neither dealing with an imposter nor a ghost living person that would open his eyes would it we'll get to see that in just a moment but let's just take a pause and say you know I do meet guys like this a lot I meet ladies like this a lot but I mainly have, sorry ladies I mainly have to do with guys okay I understand guys a lot better ladies don't understand me either <laughs> just the way it works for me I meet a lot of people who are quite like Thomas. Let's put it like that. It's safer for me to say that. I'm not the only person to suggest that. There are clear parallels between the psychology and the behaviour of Thomas and our contemporary anxious and strictly hopeless sceptics. Now, of all the facts of faith that give comfort and hope to our age of anxiety, surely the resurrection is going to be the biggest. It's a real hope giver. But here's Thomas doubting and depressing himself over that one. What we've got to take on board, I think, is this, and we don't often recognise this, perhaps particularly as evangelical believers. Many people in the world all around us, they, they, they don't make their decisions on the basis of evidence and facts. Have you noticed that? Many of the people we deal with don't decide on the basis of reasoning. And we can be like that too. Many people around us doubt the resurrection, as Keller puts it, on the basis of temperament as much as reason. And that's a lot for you to take on in a, in a bit of a rush like that. I've just blurted it out, haven't I, like the guys did with Thomas. But uh, hang on, think about that a minute. How many folks around us are actually deciding about Jesus on the basis of their temperament, or their preconceived idea, or how they feel, rather than rationality? Oh, they come back to rationality. To cover then for the decisions they've made. But they started with what they feel like. Don't we? Don't we? I see that in churches too. We've got to take that on board if we're going to be sharing our faith with people. Rural people, in my experience, tend to be a bit more transparent about this. What would my dad have done? I'll do that. 
rather than working out a reasoned analytical case for what's going on. People tend to be sceptical about the facts of the faith then, as Keller says, as much on the basis of temperament as reason. I, I'd want to go further than that. From a purely human perspective, regeneration aside, I want to say that behind the most intellectual arguments against the facts of the faith, and the life-giving hope of the resurrection is a major one of those facts of the faith, there often lies a matter of temperament that drives the passion for the intellectual argument, which will avoid the implication perhaps I ought to believe. Is that too long a sentence? Do you want me to do it again? <laughs> so often people have come to a position and then they come to reasons to give you why they're not going to believe. But they've come to that position first. Love, care, hope. The embodiment of the gospel in a human personality. There's far more to deal with that than intellectual apologetics. That's not to say that intellectual apologetics doesn't have to be there. It has to be true, but that's not how most people decide. Here's Thomas deciding on the basis, I'm suggesting to you, of his temperament and how he feels at the moment. And that has massive implications for how we commend faith to unbelieving people. Because if that's the case, we may find that intellectual apologetics alone is not going to change a thing. Now we're going to have to open the ears a little bit, perhaps along the way at the start, when people object that dead people simply can't come back to life. Thomas, in common with many Jewish people of his day, would find it hard to swallow. He'd have believed, like the others, like Martha, back in John 11, dealing with Jesus, that yes, there'll be a resurrection at the end of the age, not now. And who says, Jesus, I'm the resurrection and the life, and I'm here now. <laughs> Get this. There's this preconceived position that people are happy and comfortable with, and it needs to be addressed to give the hope that folk need from Christ to overcome the burden of anxiety, the bog, the mire, in which we wade as much as Thomas and folk in his time. So, One more thing, maybe, about Thomas. If Thomas is of that sort of pessimistic disposition, and I've seen this in a lot of people, you wouldn't believe. And I'm privileged to be in a position where guys talk to me. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> about what's going on. There's often the voice in somebody's heart that says, don't get my hopes up. It would be too painful to be disappointed if it turned out not to be true in the end. Have you come across that? Some people are nodding, which really encourages me a lot, because this is something I see and I, I share with you because I've seen it. Many of the anxious people in our world are not finding the hope that is there in the gospel because they, they don't dare believe, because it, they hardly dare believe it would be true. It's so good. The gospel's too good. We can't risk it. And we need to give confidence to folks who are in that position. Well, a worldview that says it can't happen, a temperament that predispos predisposes to scepticism, even cynicism, and scepticism is very fashionable in our society. A heart fearful of disappointment, hardly daring to think this could possibly tr be true. All that ranged against the clear eyewitness testimony of close and trusted friends of long standing, who also, also testified to us, by the way, because we've got the Gospels and their testimony in them. There's the anatomy of the scepticism of Thomas. And there's the root of the anxiety right there. Do you see? In that scepticism about the hope that's held out in the gospel, Thomas makes a journey from doubt to faith. How do you do it? I'm going to summarise a bit because I got too excited about what's gone before. But what we see, I think, in Thomas are three steps from scepticism and anxiety to faith, joy and rejoicing and a life of purpose the guy goes on to live. And that's a major, tra that's a fantastic transition. Firstly, Thomas received the apostolic testimony. 
He heard and then he accepted the testimony of the apostles. In this case, they said, we've seen the Lord. Indeed they did and indeed they had. And the significant change is that by verse 28, Thomas has renounced publicly his earlier hostile response to what they've been saying. Thomas has seen and heard from the Lord. There's no possibility Thomas is going to need first to get really hands-on experience with Jesus. Jesus invited that. He said, come on, put your hand here. But there's no hint that Thomas paused to check the nail holes before confessing, before proclaiming his faith in Jesus. Look, Thomas put his faith in Jesus, having abandoned the previous preconditions. He met Jesus and hope dawned over the cynic and his previous skepticism. How'd you do that? How can I do that? Well, you can get hold of the eyewitness testimony to Jesus, who still speaks faith to doubt through the pages of his word. If I ask you how many New Testaments you think we give away on an average uh, market day in Carmarthen Mart, how many do you reckon? How many? You're a man of faith. <laughs> You're farmers. <laughs> About five. About five a market day. Is that astonishing? People don't want to know the Bible, of course they don't want to know. You've just not realistically given it to them or offered them, like they think they can reach out and have a look. Astonishing, isn't it? Examine the eyewitness testimony. Thomas now takes it seriously, and it's transforming to him. And he had the same eyewitnesses telling him that Jesus was raised from the dead, as we do. They've written it down for us in the book. Takes seriously the eyewitness testimony. He receives it and accepts it. Secondly, Thomas made the good news personal. This is phenomenal. My Lord and my God. <laughs> is Thomas saying that? For those who do this stuff, hokurios mu kai hotheos mu. You want, for me, that's pretty emphatic. He's saying, it seems to me, Lord of mine, God of mine. Wow. Something else, isn't it? Lord of mine, God of mine. Sounds like a song that should be sort of from City of Light or somebody. If we can get City of Light or somebody to write the song, I think we could sing it. That would be a great song. Lord of mine, God of mine, you know? Maybe one of you will go home and write it for us. Can you see what's happened here? This is not the Lord, you are the Lord. This is my Lord. This is not you are the God. This is you are my God. He's got hold of it, isn't he? That's for me. I'm having that. I'll have some of that. What swung it for him? Jesus appeared that second time to the disciples who Thomas had now given sufficient credibility to be with them the next time the Lord joined them in their private meeting place. He turned directly to the doubter and he invited Thomas to put his hand in and immediately Thomas made his confession of faith of the Lord's deity and of his lordship. Where did that suddenly come from? I want to suggest to you it wasn't the wounds but the words of the Saviour that convinced Thomas. Not so much the words, the wounds, as the... Did I get it the wrong way around? Not so much the wor wounds as the words, the words. Look what Jesus said to him. Jesus is saying to him, you know all that time you thought you were on your own? I was listening. Because Jesus immediately, without having been there, as far as Thomas was concerned, immediately addresses exactly what Thomas had said in objection when the other disciples had said... He's risen from the dead. What the Lord said to Thomas showed he's well aware of the things Thomas had said when the Lord wasn't visibly present. Which must mean he had been there present but totally unseen all the time Thomas was going through it. And caring for him enough to come back. Because the Lord has come back to a guy who was pretty blunt in his refusal to believe. And still he loves me. And still he loves me. See the point? What Thomas is overcome by is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the grace and the love and the mercy of this God of his. This Lord of his. It's the love of God. In the end, 
not the judgment of God that breaks the hardest heart and wins to Christ. There is tremendous blessing of not having seen but still believed, says Jesus. Oh, you and I can go and hear the words. We shan't have the experience of Thomas. Thomas needed to see the risen Jesus because he was going on to be a, a, an apostle. An apostle, capital A apostle, was a person who, who, you know, had seen the risen Lord and could testify to that fact, right? So he gets a bit of a privilege, you might think, but Jesus is saying, don't you think like that? Blessed are those who've not seen, still heard, and believed. That's great news because that's you and me, okay? We're trying to say that once Thomas saw and heard Jesus, all his preconditions for faith, touched the wounds and so on, fell instantly aside, because what Jesus said showed he knew exactly what a failure Thomas had been, and loved Thomas, and wanted to reach out to him anyway. And what Thomas saw was grace. And I see and I hear people in livestock markets and all sorts of places where rural people gather across Wales through the week, who are overcome by their own inadequacy and failure. And when I dare, because I can, because Jesus loves me, right? To let them see that I'm a failure, a sinner, a rebel, and a failure. But the grace of God is with me. That opens the heart, you know. And when I dare, in the course of my week, to let people know something has been going on in my life in the week and how the Lord just impacted that. How he got involved, how he, how he led me, said something, showed me something, changed something for me. People see what it's like to, to have a resurrected Jesus, one who's alive. What, you mean, he's real? Yes. <laughs> yes, he's real. He walks with me and he talks with me a long life's narrow way. Where did that come from? The depths of my memory somewhere. That's what it is. That is what it is. Oh, what Thomas saw was grace and a living Jesus. So there was hope for him. Hope for a fearful, anxious Thomas's soul. I wasn't on my own. There's hope. Conclusion. Are we on conclusion? Yes. Did he put that up five minutes ago? Or is he moving me along? Oh, good, okay. Conclusion, guys, there is hope for our era and in our experience of circumstantial anxiety. The anxiety born of our circumstance. It, it, it lies not in relished and nurtured scepticism and cynicism. For many of us, that is what we turn from to Christ. That is, is a technical word coming up here for the theologians. That is what we repent of as we come to Christ. That's what we leave behind, throw off. Like the coat I threw off as I came in from feeding cattle today. So I threw it on the floor and walked away by the washing machine. But, you know, you do. It's what we throw off. I can use the washing machine. I'm very technical. <laughs> I do use the washing machine. Actually, I've used it today with... Okay. There's hope for our era of anxiety. We need to throw off that skepticism. We don't, we don't have to have the same experience Thomas had, but we do need to make the same discovery that Thomas made. The discovery that Christ turns back to pick up the hopeless, heartbroken, undeserving individual when I have resisted him all this time. turns back for me and he was there for me all the time I just didn't see him I just didn't see him there's hope for those who come back from there and trust in Christ and his resurrection which, which, which didn't revolutionize Thomas his entire life sending him out we understand to take the good news he'd learned about Christ to the subcontinent of India what a place to go you think oh, West Wales is pretty rough <laughs> 
Off to India with the gospel? His life on the line. Because of the hope held out in Christ. And we understand, it's not in the Bible, but we understand, giving his life with joy and purpose to making the living Lord, who loved him, known. That's the version of Thomas I want to be. Not that first one. Because in the second one, the new Thomas, and in all that he stood for and all that he embodied and all that he spent his life talking to people about, winning people to, there is hope in a surrounding era of anxiety. Amen? Amen. When I fear my faith will fail, inspired choice, Christ will hold me fast. 